Maybe I'm crazy, but I have a husband. Maybe I'm crazy, maybe I'm crazy, maybe I'm not. So excited. Welcome to Maybe I'm Crazy Podcast. I'm Joy Taylor. Thank you for joining us this week. We talked to the star of Snowfall on FX, Franklin Saint himself, Damson Idris, joins us. And uh, we talk about some American football, some Super Bowls how he got into acting, uh, his philosophy on acting. It's a very interesting conversation. And I also, of course, inform him that he is my husband in my head. And he, I feel like he was very welcoming to it, to the idea. Um, but he's great. Heller is out today, but we still have Donnie and T on the pod. So we have to get into the T, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. I did not ask Samson about it. Um, I, I, I probably, guess I probably should have, but you know, I'm sure that they're all probably, you know, all the, all our friends in the UK are getting asked about that ad nauseum. So, uh, we are going to discuss that interview with Auntie O. Oprah is back. She, uh, she, she never went anywhere, but she definitely came back to remind everybody that she's still, she's still the one for these interviews out here. Okay. Don't get it twisted. That was unbelievable. Uh, and we'll talk about Space Jam, a few of the, uh, the, the controversies surrounding the new Space Jam, um, and cancel culture, which I feel like I talk about every week. Um, and, but I can now officially say uh, someone has been canceled. It took a long time for me to find someone who's actually been canceled that didn't do anything. Um, Pepe Le Pew, no more. So we'll talk about that. But let's get started with Damson Idris. Very excited to have Damson Idris, the star of Snowfall on the Maybe I'm Crazy podcast. You don't know this, Damson, but we're actually married. Um, we- <laughs> <laughs> I refer to you only as my husband and we have tea oh. together often. You don't know that. I hope that's not weird for you. But, you know, I watch your Instagram lives and I'm like, I'm sorry, me and my husband are having tea right now. I'm very busy. I can't talk. Um, <laughs> but I appreciate you making time for me, your uh, American wife in L.A. Um, <laughs> how are you? Are you well? It's, you know, it's crazy times right now. Yeah, I'm good, you know. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm in London, so... I'm aside with, you know, talking to amazing people about the show, I get to talk and see my family, which is important to me because I've been so busy. So there's that. But I'm, I'm looking for getting back to the sun, man. It's cold here. And- <laughs> it is. It's sunny in L.A. right now. It has actually been really nice uh, lately. I was going to ask you about that because you have a big family. I have a big family as well. And obviously you are an international superstar. Uh <sighs> What, what's what's that been like for your family? Oh man, they're um, just anything. Aside from even being at any level as an actor, I could have been on TV once and they would have been like, yeah, oh boy's a star. And you know, but I'm the youngest of six. So they they all they all raised me and, and they all licked me across the head on my way when I was growing up. So um, they're just incredibly proud and and, and loving it, man. They they love it. My brother, he was, I think, before the pandemic, he said he went to a party and someone was like, hey, you look like this guy I love. His name's Damson Idris. And he was like, yeah, I'm his older brother. <laughs> and then he said, he said straight from there, he was just trying to be as charming as possible. So they love it. They're enjoying it. And I'm enjoying it, too. That's amazing. So you you played soccer growing up. Oh, yeah. Right. So you're a huge soccer fan. I played soccer also. Uh, I actually got, I was recruited to play in college. It's no big deal. Um, I didn't play though. I ran track instead. Uh, But I ended up, I ended up like ending my competitive sports career in soccer because I used to play in a women's league in Miami and I tore my, I was striker. Wow. You just getting them goals in. Years ago, I used to be extremely athletic and fast. Not so much anymore. It's good now. (laughs) Yeah. Now I ride the bike, said, do some yoga. You you tore something you said? Yeah, I tore my ACL, and that after that I was like, I'm done with this competitive stuff. But what what made you stop playing soccer? It was a knee injury, man. It's always an injury, you know. When you when you play sports, you don't just lose the love for it. Like it's really hard to lose the love for something like that. And just being in England, the World Cup, Champions League, stuff like that, it's like. It's godly to us. So it was tough for me. I was like 19, 20 when I got injured. Um, but still, at that point, I knew I wasn't going to get to play for Man United anytime soon. So my family were looking at me like, yo, like, what are you going to do? And then 21, I, I started um, focusing on acting. 
and 29 now, so eight years, eight years strong. Two more than I hit the decade, can't wait. And that's amazing. It's important that you said that because you are obviously a star now and we we love Snowfall. Like, I've never met anyone who's like, eh, I'm not sure about Snowfall. Everyone loves Snowfall. And you've exploded, but you know, you, it's important you said that. You've been in the business for a long time. You know, I've been in the business since 2007 and sometimes mm -hmm. people see you, you know, I'm 34 and mm -hmm. they think, you know, I'm, I'm not that young, but you know, they're like, oh, you know, you just... You just got here like no i've been doing this for a while like quite some time so what what made you get interested in acting or were you always just wanted to be on the screen it's funny so i have to go to university right so i was forced to go to university um because all of my siblings we all have like our graduation picture in my mom's house in the living room so she was like you better go and get your your picture on the wall so I was like, oh, I'm going uni for a picture, wow. So um, I didn't know what I wanted to study though. I was gonna study sports and then my sister was like, don't do that. Then I was gonna study business and my brothers were like, don't do that. And then they were like, you're always making people laugh, study drama. And that's literally how I got into even caring about movies or anything. Being in uni, looking at the theoretical side to acting, uh, the practical side, and falling in love with it, falling in love with Stanislavski, uh, falling in love with the reactions from the crowd when you do something great on stage. Um, I, it became a compulsion. And then when I got my first opportunity to do a play, agents came, they signed me, and then it was deep end from there. It was like, all right, now you're going up for auditions and you need to work on your craft so you can get the part. Oh wow, now I'm getting paid for this. Now I'm on TV, now I'm doing this, now my family's coming to support me. It just, it was just moving, but I was really learning as I was going. I didn't have a mentor that could be like, this is what's gonna happen. It was just basically learning through my peers. You know, me, Letitia Wright, Daniel Kaluuya, Malachi Kirby. As we book roles, we'd almost check in with each other and be like, yo, I just did this and this is what I went through. And, so to see all of us striving at this point in our career today is like amazing because we all trained and started together. Um, but the bug of acting is an interesting one because I guess you fall in love with a giant. I like to call them giants, right? So you fall in love with a giant and then all of a sudden you're, you're so focused on achieving a, a status of that giant and you like to be respected like that giant is. So my giant was Sidney Poitier or my giant was Denzel or DiCaprio or, or Day Lewis. And those are the people who inspire me to keep working hard. And then once I came to LA and I linked up with the late great John Singleton, um, the rest was history, man. So uh, I'm, I'm here in LA now and I, I thought it was interesting that you started in the theater because I feel like the theater is so different than, you know, going to acting classes and, you know, now we're in a pandemic, so everybody's doing acting classes on Zoom and, you know, there's oh, yeah. no, there's no right way to come up in the business, but I do think that, you know, you're a bit of a thespian, you know, you really studied it. You, you really have, you know, the artistic backgrounds of acting and you mentioned some very big heavy hitters now that you, you came up with. Do you think that starting in the theater really helped you uh, transition to a role as different as Franklin Saint? A hundred percent. I think the theater, in my opinion, is the only place that you could truly learn how to act because every moment on that stage, you're not gonna get to do again until the next day. And the next day it's a different crowd. So you can't prove to someone after you mess up that, hey, I promise I could do it better than that. What you give them in that moment is what lives forever. It's different than film and TV where you could do multiple takes. And I mean, I, I'm not sure if every actor's experienced this, but experiencing that first fluff when you forget a line or when you don't deliver something the right way, those are lessons you can't learn anywhere else. And that, that kind of pain of failure on the stage um, gives you a, a sense of self-confidence that, that can't be taught. You, you really need to experience it. And that's why I always tell all young actors, um, get to the stage as much as possible. Um, because that's what I did. 
and many people who I admire went that route too. Um, with regards to transformation, yeah, yeah, there's so many rituals that you learn from from working on stage that you could bring when you're creating a character like Franklin's sake. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's so interesting. It's kind of similar in my business because we call it reps. So I started in radio and yeah. I really believe that radio prepared me to do live television because exactly. yeah. you can't, yeah. you just got to talk for four hours and yeah. it doesn't matter if you run out of stuff to say because three seconds feels like an eternity. So you, it's, <laughs> you just go like you're just out there. So that's a, that's very similar. So you, you talk to, you talked a lot about how you became the character of Franklin Saint and some of the experiences that you had in LA to become this real gangster. And you've spent time in LA, so you know LA is very serious about their gangsters. And this is a <laughs> this is a big um, this is a historical story that you're also telling too. Well, you know it's fun, and we love our, our gangster stories, and we love our culture, and you know talking about it. This was a, a big problem, still is for the black community and you're telling an origin story about how that happened. And a lot of ways for people who don't know or don't care about what happened during the crack ep epidemic and what it did to the black community, uh, th in some ways it's educational for them. Do you mm -hmm. feel like you get some reactions from people um, watching the show that they're like, you know, I never knew that this really happened? A hundred percent. I think the biggest shock for people when they watch Snowfall is seeing that areas like South Central and inner city areas before crack cocaine weren't actually that horrible. Yeah, they were working class neighborhoods, but people could still play out on the street. You know, when that opening shot of Snowfall, and them kids are trying to rob the ice cream truck, you could see everyone out in the road having fun. And and they don't realize that a year from there, from there um, their, their streets are gonna be paved with, with crackheads. That's insane. Um, the community used to raise the kids. It wasn't just your mom. It was the lady who lived there, the guy who lived down there. He was like, get home, your mom's gonna be home. Stuff like that, you know? And now you're, you you may be a dealer and you're seeing someone selling to that some, that person, someone selling to their aunt or someone selling to their cousin, someone selling to their to their mother. That's, that's a crazy eye opener. And I think that's what the show um, exposes um, but above all things, for me personally, I want the viewer to watch the show and to understand that crack and the happenings of crack cocaine isn't a criminal one. It was a health crisis. And many people got into the selling or using of crack because of the situations they were placed in because of the system. And when you talk about it being educational, I hope that's what people take when they watch the show. So it's, it's very heavy content. Um, and you were also in a Black Mirror episode, which I had to stop watching that show because I just felt like my spirit was heavy. <laughs> I'm like, I'm feel sad right now. When you were when you were on sets like that, where you're really dealing with very heavy content, and mm -hmm. you know, and you in the case of Snowfall, historical content. Do you feel that that energy, or are you able to just snap out of it whenever you leave the set? We feel it. We feel it so deeply, and. I I think it's important for me, um, it's interesting, those two roles, and I'd say the Twilight Zone that I did with, with Pill and Sinai as well, which was about police brutality, is you almost take on, the, it's a spiritual side to it. Um, it's different than, I just did a film called Outside the Wire where yes. there was robots and, and CGI, and that was more fun, but 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 movies like, like Farming and, and Black Mirror and these are things that could happen. These are things that did happen. So it changes your perspective of life. And you you, it, you develop a, a greater sense of empathy. And for that reason, you take it way more seriously when you're involved in those projects because you know that you're telling the story and you're representing someone who's real. And you want to be delicate with that. And you want to be prestigious with that. And you want to be respectful to them. So that's why the work always seems greater um, during the process of it because you know there's so much more at stake if you get it wrong. When you look at scripts, because when I, I'm not a huge reality TV person. I'm watching The Bachelor this year. It's the first Black Bachelor, so I'm supporting <laughs> a huge reality TV person. If you're watching them. <laughs> I, I have never watched before, though. I get credit yeah. for that. 
Um, no, I really like, well, that's why I love your show, because I really like well-scripted, well-written characters and stories, because I feel like maybe it's just, maybe it's me, like, I feel like we get almost a version of reality TV on social media all day long, so I really want to watch someone's art, and yeah. so I really like those kind of shows and movies when I get the time to watch it when I'm not watching sports. So when you're selecting a project, do you really look for that? Or like, you know, you just did Outside the Wire, which was, which was like, you, as you mentioned, very like fun. It's on Netflix, by the way. You guys can watch with Anthony Mackie, uh, another great actor. Um, do you look at scripts that way? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, I, I, like, I like stories that are saying something. I like stories that most of the time haven't been told before. Um, but at the same time, sometimes I just want to really want to work with someone. The case of Outside the Wire, Mackie was a huge pull for me because I had met him through a mutual friend and everyone was this, just wanted to have a beer with this guy. And, and I knew it would be amazing to, to work with someone of that caliber who has such great experience in the realm of action movies and movies in general. This is someone who's done over 70 movies. I knew I could be a sponge around him and I knew he could be my big brother for the longevity of my career. So you always want to attach yourself to people like that who are in the business, who have been here for long, but who are still happy. That's what he taught me. Um, with regards to other projects, it's about saying something. It's about uh, a challenge. Um, I, I love doing something when I'm scared of it. And I love doing something when I look at myself in the present and I'm like, wow, this character is so different to me. That makes it special. And I, I think as people watch my career unfold, I don't think I'm going to be an actor who does 50 movies a year. I'm, I'm, pr I'm probably going to keep it as, as tight as possible because uh, when I work, I want it to be meaningful. Have you been to New Orleans yet? Loads. Lo I love New Orleans. The first time I went to New Orleans um, was the first time I realized that American women are different to UK women. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do I want to know the story? Yeah, I was, I was. We were staying at the Ritz. We were there for Essence Festival, and um, I asked these this group of like five ladies. I was like, "Hey guys, I really want to try some beignets. Do you know anywhere cool I can go get beignets?" And they were like, "Oh my god, you from London, baby? What's your number? You can get it." And I was like. No, no woman has ever like displayed that type of confidence. Like, I was close to giving out my number to all five of them, but I, I was like, not today, ladies. I kept it moving, but I, I loved it. I loved the confidence. But um, New Orleans, to me, is just a historical city. It's so beautiful. You talk about music. There was a um, a place in New Orleans. I think it was called Congo Square or something. Yeah. Like that. But when Africans came over. They would go there and practice music in that area birthed jazz, hip hop, soul, rock and roll, everything. This is such a vibrant city. And I know we have a huge fan base there for Snowfall. Um, so yeah, just being in that city is gonna be, gonna be amazing. And Mackie's from there as well. You, you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> no, New Orleans is one of my, I'm from Pittsburgh and I lived in Miami for a, a long time and now I'm in LA, but New Orleans is, Maybe my favorite American city for all those reasons you mentioned, and it's a it's a good party town too. So uh, I like to get down, and that's a good place to do it. And they have good food. They have good food. Yeah. yeah. But that yeah. that reaction does not surprise me though. So that's not how uh, women in the UK get down. They don't just ask you for a number and tell you can get it. Okay, well, just you're not no. A woman in the UK would never walk up to you and say I like you. I don't think no. It's never happened to me in my life. Well, I mean, I started this interview by telling you you're my husband. So I guess I'm, you know, yeah. I am the stereotypical American woman. So there you go. Um, well, before I let you go, you obviously love soccer, which you call football. Mm -hmm. And American football is is our thing over here. And we kind of worship. Handball? It's called handball. Isn't it? Handball. It's not handball. It's football. We have kickers. We have kickers and punters. <laughs> So do you do you like American football? Because a lot of yep. really hardcore soccer fans don't. I do because the first game I ever went to was a Rams game, so okay. I support the Rams. This is the first game I went to, um, but the first Super Bowl I went to was in Minneapolis, and that was the Eagles versus the Patriots, and I I think I was supporting the Eagles that day. Um, I don't know, man. I usually support teams where I'm a friend with someone, 
on the team. So um, I, I've got a bunch of friends who play for the Lakers, so I support the Lakers. So, so <laughs> I'm waiting to get some more NFL buddies, and then I'll, I'll see what team I should support. Okay, well, okay. So, so at least you like it. Football was Manchester United all day to the end. Oh yeah, yeah, Manchester United. Yes, yes. That's uh, that's on your wiki. It's every, like that is your team. <laughs> we know that. Uh, well, thank you so much, Damson. This was a, a wonderful conversation. I appreciate you taking the time. Watch Snowfall on FX if you haven't. If you're the like one person who doesn't watch, because everyone I know watches the show, but uh, it's amazing. The season has already started, so easy to catch up on. Um, wonderful show. You guys do an amazing job. Can't and wait. you can and you can watch Outside the Wire with Anthony Mackey on Netflix as well. Um, but go support. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, stay safe and enjoy your family. You too. Bless you. Thank you. See you soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. See you soon. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> bye, bye. Bye. What's up, Donnie? What are we doing in High Key, Low Key this week? What is up? All right. High Key, the saga of the Dak Prescott contract talks have finally, finally come to an end. It is over. After signing a multi-year deal with $126 million guaranteed, Dak is now the second highest paid quarterback in the NFL. Low-key, from breaking an ankle to breaking the bank, he showed what a Dakless Dallas team looks like, and it wasn't good. Joy, Dak bet on himself and won, just not in the way that we expected. Definitely not in the way that we expected, and he's got guts. He got guts. Uh, he's, he got guts. That's the sequel to he got, got game. He got guts. He, he got guts. Because <laughs> he did not, he didn't break. He had all the leverage and he dared them and he got the deal. I mean, what did yeah. he not get? He got the guaranteed money. He got the, the years. He got the amount for the years. He got mm -hmm. the signing bonus. He got the no trade clause. What didn't he get? What? All the <laughs> I things. Mean, and, da and Dallas got their franchise quarterback. So yeah. I think everyone's looking at this money and we do this every time with quarterbacks, which is what drives me crazy about it. The market resets. That's what happens. Yeah. The next guy is. up is going to be the next highest paid and the next guy up isn't going to be paid more. And then that's how it works. Now yeah. there's no like endless climb to the salary cap, but we do know that it does go up, go up incrementally mm -hmm. each year, usually not in a non pandemic year, it's going to reset. They're going to have plenty of money again. They already have fans coming back by the, by fall. We're all assuming that it's going to be at full capacity in a few years when this contract really becomes uh prohibitive to the Dallas Cowboys that's when the salary cap is going to go up significantly it's similar to Patrick Mahomes contract so yes is Dak making a lot of money yes is that good yes yes is he Patrick Mahomes no it doesn't matter though when Jared Goff signed his contract everyone was freaking out ah he's not Tom Brady <laughs> like there's one Tom Brady there's one Aaron Rodgers there's one Patrick Holmes there's run what's one Russell Wilson okay that's so how you yep, want to say that all four of them or are worth that kind of money or Deshaun Watson, um, who I, I think, quite frankly, as much as I love Deshaun, I wouldn't put in that category. Tom Brady has won a Super Bowl. Aaron Rodgers has won a Super Bowl. Russell Wilson has won a Super Bowl. Yeah, rings. Even I That's just the mentioned difference. that I'm, I'm missing. Patrick Holmes has won a Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. So, yes, like they are making a lot of money for players who haven't won a Super Bowl, but we know that Dak Prescott is capable of winning the division multiple times because he's done that. We've yep. seen what they are without him. He deserved this money. You know, Jalen Ramsey tweeted something really funny because he's totally right. 40 million, it's always deserved. They're not just out here giving out free money. Yeah, you got to earn that. That's a lot of money to just be it's, given. It doesn't work it's, that way. It does, it's not, <laughs> they're, they're not just giving away $40 million. It's absolutely yeah. deserved. If you want to argue that they're not going to have certain pieces around him or whatever, you know what? Before they were paying him, they didn't have the right pieces around him. So why does he owe the Cowboys any money? He doesn't. This mm -hmm. is his first big contract. He deserves to get paid. The Dallas Cowboys need to worry about putting together that offensive line because they're ranked 27th in the league right now. So for yeah. all that talk about, oh, you know, Dak's not that good, his offensive line has been that terrible. He was sacked 56 times in 2018. They're living That's off the reputation many. of his rookie year. Everyone's like, oh, like, he hasn't been as good as his rookie year and Zeke hasn't been as good. Their offensive line is not good. Mm -hmm. You got to protect the, the asset. The quarterback need that. <laughs> they yeah. need that to do, to do well. So that's what the Dallas Cowboys need to focus on now. They've got their franchise quarterback. This is the right thing to do. And most of all, most of all, we can finally stop talking about Dak Prescott's money. Which is Yeah. I feel like we talked about it the entire time that I've worked at Fox. I think this is all new territory for me. 
<laughs> it's, a new, it's gonna be a new world i don't remember yeah. you know it's like now i'm like i don't remember what we talked about before covid i don't remember a time when we didn't talk about zach prescott's money so yeah. uh i'm excited for that congratulations Dak. you deserve every penny congrats on having a, a clearly great agent who guided you perfectly through this whole scenario you bet on yourself and it paid yep. off tremendously the Kirk Cousins route, uh, the franchise tag is your friend. It, don't don't be afraid of it. It worked if you out. Play for it that. right. Yeah, exactly. All right, high key with Dallas locking up Dak for the next few years. Russell Wilson's list of preferred trade destinations has now been whittled down to three: Chicago, Vegas, and New Orleans. Low key, which of these options do you see as the best case scenario for Russell, including staying put in Seattle? That's still clearly an option. I think the best case scenario is to stay in Seattle. To be honest with you, um, agreed. I think New Orleans is number two. Vegas is number three and Chicago is number four. I know Chicago is very reportedly being very aggressive about trying to get Russell Wilson. And I don't think it's a necessarily bad place for him to go. They just franchise tagged Allen Robinson. Yeah. I like their defense. Uh, although their defense wasn't as good as it has been of late last year, but Seattle is the best place for him. The problem is Seattle has clearly gotten this idea in their minds that they can do better than Russell Wilson or that they don't need Russell Wilson. Yeah. And that's just this nonsense. It's silly. What, what are we talking about here? I, I, I can't believe that this is even a story. It actually blows my mind. You know what? Reverse the situation. Like what's happening with Russell Wilson is what should be happening with Deshaun Watson. And what's happening mm. with Deshaun Watson in Houston is what should be happening with Russell Wilson. Yeah. <laughs> Where the Houston Texans are like, eh, no, we are not trading Deshaun Watson. You are not about to play us. Yes. Now, I still think that they will end up trading him, but they're certainly acting like they are they are not about to budge. Meanwhile, the Seahawks are like, who are you to talk about us? <laughs> we can do better than you. I know you're running around for your life and getting sacked 44 times and a, a season on average and are, and are on pace to be sacked more than any quarterback in the history of the league Ugh. but we made you no. yeah you're welcome russell russell wilson <laughs> made the seahawks so uh -huh. let's not get it twisted he is the reason why they are winning he is the reason why they are relevant he is the yeah. star franchise quarterback best player in franchise history don't at me okay this is a legitimate problem situation for seattle i think it is nonsense that they're even being reported as taking calls yeah, there's even crazy. a notion that they would move off of russell wilson get it together everyone doesn't have to get along all the time yeah and sometimes life. you just gotta take the l you do stuff in your personal Nike. life all the time that you don't want to do <laughs> why can't you just compromise and make it work with russell wilson i i think he's going to end up being there anyway i think all this is just kind of fodder and he's not really going anywhere Agreed. but i think i think he's just kind of flexing because you know he wants more influences he should he deserves it if that's what he wants all he's asking for is a better offensive line and a little input on on personnel whoop do you do yeah like yeah. he's asking for uh, the the you know street outside the stadium to be named after him and pick out a new uniform design like relax just listen to him hear him out and the offensive line thing is something you should do anyway all the rest of us see it so apparently yeah. the only people that don't have any idea that the offensive line needs some upgrades are the seattle seahawks figure it out seattle they will i think they're gonna they're gonna come to terms this is all just all season bluster like you just said it's all gonna work itself out in the long end all right High key, Blake Griffin has left the very rebuildy Pistons for the greener pastures of Brooklyn from the bottom to the top of the East, just like that. Low key, with the addition of the former All-Star, are the Nets now the favorite to win it all this season? <laughs> well, I don't know that Blake Griffin is what put them over the edge, but I do <laughs> love this move because it's just another name and they feel very like Lakers of last year. Like it's, it's, it's beyond uh, just having the big three there. Like they're bringing oh, yeah. in all these veterans or even in, in the conversation about Andre Drummond too. So, <laughs> and like the Lakers are trying to get him. He's obviously very expensive, but you know, I, I just love that the nets are being aggressive. I like aggressive and aggressive pays off in sports. If you're paying attention. So look, I still think that the Lakers are, if they're healthy are going to, win the West. Um, I know Lakers fans are freaking out because I said the jazz would beat them in a seven game series right now. Like as, as if they're watching someone else play for the Lakers, cause Anthony Davis is not out there, yeah. but um, yeah, I mean, I think the Lakers when they're healthy, when they get Anthony Davis back 
will come out of the West. I think it's going to be Brooklyn and, and the Lakers in the finals. And I, I want to wait and see what they look like before I make a prediction on that. But I, I was on Brooklyn before James Harden got there, before Blake Griffin got there. I think he's going to play a role similar to what D- Dwight Howard did, where, you know, he's a former star, huge mm-hmm. name, but he is not the same player anymore. Blake, Blake Griffin hasn't dunked since 2019. The Blake Griffin yeah. of Lob City is no more, but he is Please. still a smart player. He can still contribute. And, uh, you know, I think when players like that get an opportunity to play a pivotal role, they are actually incredibly valuable. And I think that Blake knows that and sees that. And that's why he's with the Nets. Agreed. He's going to have less minutes. Clearly, he's going to be coming off the bench. It's probably going to work out. All right. Heike, with a second season of Cam in New England seeming unlikely and the Pats not being sold on Jared Stidham, it's being reported that Jimmy Garoppolo is in the team's A plan or plan A at quarterback this offseason. Low key, while it would be a good move, New England trading for the familiar face also, to me at least, feels like an admission that it was a mistake trading him in the first place. I think that post Brady era planning could have gone a little bit smoother. Well, yeah, it definitely could have gone smoother. I don't know that they would have been able to afford him while keeping Brady, but. I just think it's weird that their plan A is on another team. Like you don't have Jimmy Garoppolo. How can that be your plan A? He doesn't play for you. <laughs> like unless you are, unless you know something the rest of us don't know. And, and and furthermore, look, this is where I'm at with Jimmy Garoppolo. I think Jimmy Garoppolo got a lot more heat for losing that Super Bowl than he deserved. Right? Like, yeah. You're a loser, so you know people are going to talk that way about your team because you didn't win. But he was one throw away from winning the Super Bowl. I think he played in a great year. He has the potential, obviously, to lead a team to a Super Bowl. Yep. You know, they have a great defense. You can argue about all the other pieces, but he was the quarterback of that team, and that's how quarterbacks are measured. He got to a Super Bowl and was one throw away from winning it. So we yeah. know he has the talent. But me, personally, I can't get down with inconsistency. I'm a Capricorn. I cannot t- tolerate it. And being consistently injured will turn me off to a player. Like, it doesn't mean that they're not incredibly talented when they're available, but you can be incredibly talented, say like an Anthony Davis and constantly injured. And that lowers your value to me. And and obviously Anthony Davis is far more talented than the scale of, you know, Jimmy Garoppolo. Um, I don't even know far, but like, you know, he is, he's one of the top players in the league. And I don't know if many people would describe Jimmy Garoppolo that way. However, Jimmy Garoppolo has been injured so much that it, he's, he's starting to get in that Sam Bradford territory. He's, he's, yeah. he's, he's tiptoeing around it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I just, we're, we're starting to describe him more by his injuries and his actual play. So he does have the potential, but I don't think he's the answer in New England. He's clearly very fragile. They don't have a lot of weapons. So unless they plan on upgrading in that space as well, I really don't know what he's going to do any differently for New England. It's like he's, he has a talent, but is he going to be on the field? And there's a lot of concern about how, how injured he really is. Like how serious is this injury that he's yeah. coming off of? Is he going to even be the same? So I like Jimmy. I think people were a little hard on him after that Super Bowl loss, but you can't argue with the injuries. It's just too much. That's just, just who he is at this point, right? Yeah. Hi, T. It's time for the tea. What's going on in the culture report? Let's Ooh, get some girl. British tea. <laughs> British tea. I love it. Girl, so much tea. Um, wow, what an interview. I I'll just start off by saying I love how transparent Megan and Harry both were. I learned so much from this interview and I'm happy we got to hear their side of the story. Um, and Joy, honestly, was pretty spot on from like what I thought. People just painting Megan as this villain, saying these awful things about her and no one speaking up for her. So I was was never convinced that she was the problem and the person with some hidden agenda. It all comes down to racism and none of us are shocked by that. I believe that Harry and Megan were being mistreated and it's not about her taking Harry from his family. It's about a man putting his wife first as he should. So I mean, I can't imagine like how he feels being cut off from your family in that way. No security, no title questions about your child's skin color that's like a lot to go through mentally and I think we as people are just so critical of others we don't even know what it's like being in their shoes so I just appreciate people like Tyler Perry that allowed them to stay in his home and provided security like that's what I'm talking about like that doesn't sound to me like they were planning to leave all along I believe that they had no choice and I'm so glad that they finally spoke their truth and I don't want to hear anyone else saying anything else about it because where were y'all when she was getting bashed 
silent. You, were you silent or were you <laughs> silenced? You were silent. Yes. So I learned so much from this interview. Okay, first, I was one of those people that was like, no, this was their plan all along. Um, and not in a negative way. Like I thought, I just felt like Harry was tired of that bullshit. So he was like, you know, let's get this wedding. Let's have this baby. And then we're just gonna be gonna be out. Um, but so clearly that wasn't the case. And I had no problem with that strategy, by the way. But clearly that wasn't the case. I'm not surprised that they're raging racist. Now, listen, I'm not gonna sit here and act like when Megan said it, I didn't faint because I did. And Oprah's reaction was appropriate. But, you know, when we think about the royal family, okay, like <laughs> this is generations of colonialism that we're talking about here. Like they are the originals of birthers of this mentality. So it shouldn't be surprising to all of us that that exists at a heavy level in that, what did she call it? The firm and in the family. Now yeah, I took, mm -hmm. uh, one, so, so that was the first learn that I, I, cause I thought that it was somewhat planned. Um, so learn that it was planned and, the, and the, the reasons are completely justified. No security, no title. I'll be like, Fuck this bullshit too. Bye. Bye. <laughs> um, you're not about to change the rules for my son. What part of the game is that? You think I'm gonna deal with all this and you're not going to give him a title? No, 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 no. Bye. So I'm, I'm totally cool with that. I don't, Megan, I just, I have a hard time believing you didn't Google him. I'm just saying, I just, <laughs> you don't Google a prince. All right. It's fine. You know what I'm saying? You got to Google people now. When you meet them, you got to Google them. You got to make sure they don't have a record. You know what I mean? So like, it's, it's fine. Well, it's okay. You didn't Google him. Fine. Uh, but I think that the biggest, the biggest learn from this situation should be that one, you never know what people are going through. And I think we live in a society where, you know, people, um, and rightfully so, like there is a bit of a disdain for the privileged because for, for a long time, there has been a separation and a gap and a, a lack of um, empathy towards other people that has existed in many spaces in the world. But just because you are a prince or a duchess and you are in one of the, you're in a palace, doesn't mean that you are living this life that you imagine for other people. I mean, people tell me all the time about how I live my life, like, and, and, and what I do and how much money I make and how I grew up. And I just really sit here like, y'all don't know me at all. Like when I say you don't know me, you really do not know me. Like I choose, we talked about this uh, a couple weeks ago. I choose to allow you to see what I want you to see. Like not to say that I'm not an authentic person, but I'm a private public figure. So I don't need everybody in my business. You don't need to know where I be all the time. You don't need to know who I'm, who I'm with, who I'm kicking it with, who my friends are, what I, what, you don't need access to all that. I need a space from the world and my life. And because of that, you really don't know me like that. And you don't know how I grew up and you don't know what my family experiences are. So I could relate to what she was talking about when she's like, you know, people don't just don't have any empathy for what I was going through, like, and being suicidal. And when you are in a space like that, mental space like that, and then you have to go and be on, it is all the more exhausting because you have to pull from a place in that you've never had to pull before because you're totally empty when you're suicidal to, to manufacture this, this face for people, because that's what you're supposed to do, because that's what your job is. And then that's what their job was. So I thought it was very revealing. It was very honest. Um, I'm kind of joking about the Googling thing a little bit. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, they, they had to tell their truth and I'm glad they did. And it's, it's time that people, um, you know, we have, not an obsession with the royal family, obviously the way that they do in the UK, but we're raised on Disney movies and I've always known who the princes were and Princess Diana and, you know, they're, they're the monarchy. Like there is something to being the king and queen. Like we don't have that in America, even though Donald Trump tried to make it that way. So we don't have that kind of, really until Trump, like we don't have that kind of worship of our politicians because they're gone, you're gone. All right, if we're next, like we vote you out. You, you, it was nice, you know, we'll give you some, some some security services for the rest of your lives. But like, 
on to the next one and they don't have that. So, you know, they are, there's a bit of a protection. Um, I also thought it was very telling that, um, that they wouldn't protect them from the media. And that's really, you know, the, the, the racism and the deep rooted hatred that exists in those spaces um, is being exposed at the highest level now. And that is what, that's what I'm grateful came out of that interview because it's really showing, people are showing who they really are and how they react to that interview. Yeah. I think that people, I think it's so interesting that people are questioning why her and Harry decided to speak up. And it's like, people have been saying stuff about her for years and she's been silent. So she don't have a right to defend herself and speak her truth. Like who are, who are you to say that she had, that they had no right or that what they're saying is false? Like, it just doesn't make sense to me. Well, you know, she's a woman and she's a woman of color mm -hmm. and that strength is uh, always confused as uh, greed or bitterness or anger when in fact it's just the truth said with power, said with confidence and that bothers people. And there is this idea that she is supposed to be this silent figure. And I mean, Diana talked about it too. She's like, you know, strong women. And obviously Diana didn't go through the racism of it, but you know, she, I, they killed her. <laughs> so, you know, she, yeah. she went through her own journey with, with this hot ass mess. And she talked about it too. Like when you're a powerful woman, when you are, when you are loved and we Americans love Meghan Markle. That's our girl. Mm -hmm. So we're going to protect her. Yes. And, you know, so whatever y'all got going on over there, we're unconcerned. She can come back here anytime she wants to. And they showed that Tyler Perry and giving her and, and Harry and Archie a home and security and Oprah, you know, being there for her. Like when it comes down to it, you ain't gonna mess with us. We'll mess with each other, but you're not gonna mess, you y'all not gonna mess with us. <laughs> we ain't worried about none of that trash you got going on. So uh, I thought it was, I thought it was one of the most compelling interviews I've ever seen. And nobody can do it like Oprah. Oh, honey, no, Ooh. nobody, nobody. No. Nobody yeah. can do it like Oprah. <laughs> right. Who she just she she knows what questions to ask. She really brings things out of people. I love it. Because she reacts authentically, but she also asks the questions that the other side, like people who are watching it who don't agree with what's going on, mm -hmm. she asks those questions too in a yeah. way that isn't alarming to the subject. It's really like a masterclass on how to do this thing. She was amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Love it. Love it. All right. So Space Jam, a new legacy, got some new updates, Joy and Girl, and people are just outraged. Um, Pepe Le Pew has been removed from the movie. Um, Warner Brothers, I guess, felt that he added to rape culture. And someone like myself that grew up on Looney Tunes, like I never thought that Pepe Le Pew gave rape vibes. I mean, he loves love and he's like a hopeless romantic, but he's a skunk and he smells. So people are always running away from him. And I, growing up, I found it funny. My mind just never went there. And so then you also have these concerns about Lola Bunny being desexualized. Like she's no longer showing her midriff and she has on like biker shorts underneath her uniform. And like, I understand why this had to be done because everyone is so incredibly sensitive about everything. If they would have kept it things as is, people would have found something to complain about. So I feel like that they had to do this to protect themselves so people could just enjoy the movie and there wouldn't be all this controversial like things mentioned. And it just sucks, but honestly, like this is the reality of it. Yeah, you know, I had to toss this over a couple of times because you know, when I feel strongly about something, is there some things that are just not worth it? You know, it's like, you know what? I care about this, but I ain't getting into it. Everybody about this. <laughs> I got stuff to do and errands to run today. <laughs> but, you know, people are, there's, so there's the two sides of it. I actually think there's three sides of it. I think there's where you and I stand, which is, it's not really necessary to cancel Pepe Le Pew. Just not, it's not necessary. It's, no. I'm with you. That was my experience of Pepe Le Pew. Um, he just really, he really liked that lady skunk, you know, and he just wanted some kisses and affection and Lola, like I was Lola bunny for Halloween four years ago. I mean, that's an iconic character. And actually I liked Lola bunny's character in that she was sexy and she was strong and she was like, no, I'm gonna play all these men and I'm gonna look good while I'm doing it, which a bad self Lola. 
So that's where I am on both those characters. There is a sensitivity, like you said, to everything now. And I think it's just getting to a point where it's getting exhausting for everyone because they're, you know, the small group of people that will be upset about Pepe Le Pew and Lola are like, I just feel like it pushes people, things like this. Well, you know, some people may feel strongly about that and that's fine. I'm not judging, you know, if you feel like it, you know, endorses that, um, that, then that's how you feel. But you're putting people in a space where it's like, okay, well, let's just, let's just cancel everything. Like, let's just cancel everything. Everything is something. And everything is not something. Some things are something. And they deserve attention and they deserve time and they deserve space and they deserve a platform. And what did we just talk about? <laughs> I mean, the monarchy who has, who has, uh, who has perpetuated and clearly still lives in a space of utter racism. I mean, someone in his family who he doesn't even feel comfortable mentioning asked, you know, had concerns about the color of the baby's skin. It is 2021. So that deserves the what? That deserves the platform and the attention. And I, like, who cares about the people who are like, cancel culture, blah, blah, blah. I'm not concerned about those people because they really just, as I've ranted for many weeks now, they just don't want consequences for their actions. But like Pepe Le Pew and Lola Labani are cartoons. And, you know, I, I just, I feel like it's a bit much. Is that safe to say? Can I say that? I, I agree. I understand it's a kid's movie. You'd be like, oh, it's a kid's movie. They shouldn't show that. It's like, it's Space Jam. Like, is it a kids a, movie? A, because we're all gonna watch it. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely. I mean, I still watch Space Jam. Like to this right. day, I'm, I, so everyone like, I don't, does. I don't even think it is a kids movie. It's like it's it's an everybody movie. <laughs> it's definitely an everybody movie. Not saying like, and, and obviously there are kids that are going to watch it, but like, I don't know. I just feel like it's a bit much. I feel like it's a bit much. I agree. Don't cancel me, but I feel like Lola <laughs> Bunny and uh, Pepe Le Pew are just not as problematic as we're making them out to be. Yeah, I don't, and, and I think, and that's our opinion. Like people are entitled to feel how they feel. It's just, people are always gonna find, like I said, they're always gonna find something to complain about or it, it's it's always gonna be a problem. Even it's, if they would have. We have, we have some bigger fish to fry. Thanks so much for joining us this week, guys. Hope you enjoyed the interview. Make sure you subscribe and share and follow us on social media at Maybe I'm Crazy Pod, myself at Joy Taylor Talks. And you can listen to the podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, iHeartMedia app and Apple Podcasts. Stay safe and we'll catch you next week. Maybe I'm crazy, maybe I'm not. Ooh.